And we're back with the Classic Auto Mall podcast from the Classic Auto Mall studio in Morgantown, Pennsylvania, and uh, have a special guest. We have two special guests with us today, one in studio, uh, who's been on the show quite a while back with us, Jeff Bleemeister, who's the executive director of the uh, AACA Museum in Hershey, and Mark Lieberman, uh, for lack of a better terminology, Mark, you're the Tucker whiz expert guru, is that Fair? I'll go with that, sure. I mean, I do see a bunch of Tuckers behind you in a picture, so that uh, certainly says something well, about it. Yeah, I'm sitting here in the plant today, so it'll... <laughs> it really looks like you're in the plant. See, I'm, I'm going to have to do the same thing with my Cobra picture behind us. I'm going to have to make it look more like I'm in it. And uh, right, But right. That, yeah, at first when I saw that, I'm like, where is he? Is he in some fact? And you are in Michigan, so it's not, it's not out of the realm that you couldn't be in a factory somewhere, correct? Right. You know, we, uh, uh, Jeff and I, Jeff, I had him on the show, oh, like I said, probably one of our first shows, probably a year and a half or so ago, Jeff, and uh, uh, talking about the AACA Museum and all the wonderful things that you do. And uh, it still continues just to grow and grow and grow. You guys are, are a success story in the museum world that not many people enjoy. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you see it that way. We, we, we agree, you know, we're we rebuilt, we bonded, we re-advertised or branded ourselves last year as America's Transportation Experience. And right. 2023 is an important year for us for many reasons. It's our 20th anniversary as a public museum. Wow. Which is fantastic. And we have a whole series of, of, of events planned for the year. But it's also the 75th anniversary of the launch of the Tucker 48, the Tucker Automobile, which is iconic part of automotive history. And that's where Mark's going to uh, come into this program today. You know, the museum sure. has the largest collection of Tucker automobiles and automobilia in one spot in the whole right. world. Isn't it amazing how those were salvaged and saved? And, you know, we didn't know about collectability of cars back in, in the 40s. My goodness, nobody was thinking about no, that. No, every one of those vehicles is accounted for. Wow. They, most of them still exist, as Mark will tell you. Right, right, right. And, and the reason that the AACA Museum kind of has a Tucker influence, is it by happenstance or did it, was it designed or how did that come about? Uh, years ago, before we actually built the museum, one of our, our founders, Bill Smith, AACA Executive Director right. at the time, had a, developed a relationship with, with uh, Mr. Kamek of Virginia. The Kamek family, he had, he had collected three of the vehicles plus the blueprints, test engines, chassis, all wow. kinds of things. And their family put an addition on the building to house these things. Right. And when he passed away several years ago, the collection came to us. That's fantastic. And we've added more. You know, Mark is with us because Mark was a, the president of the Tucker Club of America. Right, right. Jack, the Tucker Automobile Club of America. And they merged with us. And now Mark is our senior Tucker advisor as well as a board member of the AACA Museum. Oh, fantastic. I didn't realize that was a mer that happened. Yeah, yeah so they, that's, they, they were t taken in as part of our uh, umbrella. And uh, they're part of the AACA Museum. And we are now the center of the Tucker Universe. And we have people <laughs> like Mark to, to help further the Tucker cause. And uh, our anniversary event is coming up in mid-June. And, and Mark's here to talk about the just the wonderful program we have put together for the public to celebrate yeah. these iconic cars. I mean, it's not just, you know, there's there's a lot of things, and you can have a car on display, but you guys have done much more than this, Mark, for this event coming up. I mean, it's going to be immersive Tuckerville, right? It will. Um, we've got, uh, uh, well, there'll be 10 cars on display. Uh, so you, not only are you going to have an opportunity to see the very first uh, Tucker production yeah. car, the first Tucker 48 on there, car number one, but you're also going to be able to see Tucker number 50, the final car off the assembly line, and then several in between. The sure. variations, uh, you'll be able to observe the uh, the people that are going to be out here taking a, a look at these cars will really get a chance firsthand to see what went on over that very short period of time, roughly eight months that they were building these cars and all the changes that took place. And and for, for those that don't know, I mean, there's rarity in the fact that they only build a few, but these things were technological marvels of the time. I mean, what's made a Tucker so special that they command the prices that they command nowadays? Well, you know, it's really quite remarkable. If you take a look at what uh, Preston Tucker and Alex Tremulus and the design staff put together uh, in these automobiles, you see some very unique features that carry forward to today. So for example, you have the first padded dashboard, you have four-wheel independent suspension, rear aluminum engine, um, a four-speed electronic pre-select transmission, very, very unique system that they actually got the ideas from, from the cord, um, where you select a gear and it doesn't do anything until you touch the clutch, and right. then it shifts for you. Um, you've also got uh, doors that are open into the roof line for easy entrance and exit, uh, interchangeable seats. You can swap front to rear. Uh, in order to even the wear on seats. 
So That's brilliant. You're really That's doing brilliant. wild stuff. Um, you also have, you know, he paid a lot of attention to safety. And so you've got uh, uh, pop-out safety windshields in these, which you didn't see uh, in other cars of the time. Uh, and then extraordinary performance. Here is an almost 19 foot long car that was capable of doing 130 miles an hour. This is a four door sedan in 1948 that would outrun just about every car on the road. Right. Well, and a padded, da you know, you mentioned the padded dash and people think, well, what's so special about that? That was a real safety thing, though, because you had metal dashes before and you hit that face first. Uh, you you wouldn't mind to have a little padding in there, right? Uh, very true. Very what, true. And, and tell me about the cord transmission. Was that an idea that they took from cord or was it an actual transmission that cord built or how did that all come about? Well, I'll, I'll walk you into this. Actually, you know, originally Preston Tucker, Preston Tucker envisioned having uh, the car propelled without a transmission. Uh, his first design was actually with a 589 cubic inch flat six that had hydrostatic drive. So you had no transmission. You had two torque converters on a transversely mounted engine that would uh, propel the car. Now uh, that was um, impractical and they didn't have the time in order to fully sort that out. So uh, in, in their dash to get the car to market, uh, they ended up using a 335 cubic inch engine that they adopted from an aviation application. It actually powered helicopters. And then they uh, mated that to the cord uh, pre-select transmission. So uh, the idea here was that he wanted to have um, a four-speed transmission that would uh, be versatile enough so it would fit compactly in the area that it needed to, but moreover, uh, give the driver a unique driving experience. If you take a look at the uh, uh, passenger compartment, you'll see that it's uh, largely devoid of objects would, that would protrude uh, at the passenger and cause injury in the event of an accident. So mm -hmm. in this instance, you have a small stalk that comes off the steering column that allows you with a little uh, lollipop lever to select <laughs> each gear Sure. And uh, uh, there's, there's, there, it's a very efficient range of motion to choose gears. Sure. We like efficient ranges of motion, but how yeah. are Tuckers to drive? Are they great to drive? Are they cumbersome? What do they feel like today? Okay. okay so, 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 uh, so uh, uh, a, Tucker a Tucker that is, that is set, set up correctly, up correctly um, and, 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 and sorted, sorted out is an, is an amazing vehicle to drive. To drive. I would, I would, uh, uh, I would I liken it to a giant, a giant 356, 356 Porsche, Porsche on steroids. steroids. <laughs> what a great analogy. Yes. <laughs> Uh, it is it, a very light front end, super easy to steer. Uh, the suspension is torsolastic tubes or a, or a torsolastic slab. So right. it's rubber suspension. There are no springs. And uh -huh. so it gives you a very unique riding experience. Sure, sure. And and I read, I was reading, I'm, I'm learning more and more about Tuckers in the past couple of days, just kind of preparing for this. And one of the unique features about a Tucker, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the engine could be removed in a very short period of time if you needed to service it. And actually the idea was that they could replace the motor while they were sorting out your motor, and then you'd come back in and do the whole thing in reverse? That was the idea. They, they wanted to have um, a very quickly replaceable drivetrain. So you brought your vehicle in for, for major service on the engine. They would give you a loaner engine instead of a loaner car. <laughs> and, uh, and you would drive away until your engine was serviced and put it back in. That, that that's certainly that that's certainly the way the movie portrayed it. Right. Okay. But it, but it's not so much the reality of the way it was. I mean, there was a combination of factors that were that were kind of working against him at the time. He was undercapitalized, even though uh, that they managed to raise to to raise with the IPO uh, twenty six million dollars. That was not enough to launch a new car sure. company, and sure. and the Tucker Corporation suffered under a number of things. One. Um, it was politically unpopular with uh, the, the Senator Ferguson in Michigan, who thought that they were going to encroach upon the car companies. But for the most part, the car, the car companies were certainly aware of them, but really weren't that threatened. In fact, 
Ford was selling him parts and steering wheels and uh, Hudson was selling him parts and Kaiser was selling him parts. Sure. So, so if they really felt that he was that they wanted to run him out of business, they wouldn't be supporting him. Right. Um, exactly. So 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 I, I don't think that it was so much that the car companies wanted to run him out of business as much as it was a problem with undercapitalization, the problem with the press uh, creating this this. Uh, uh, issue um, of of no confidence from the public because of the investigation, which turned out to be uh, unsubstantiated, and he and his management team were acquitted of all charges. But when the SEC came down upon him uh, at that period of time, and the story broke on the news before he was even before he was even aware that it was happening, it was pretty much a, a, a political and news hit job. Sure, sure. I mean, you would think that such a great car like that would have been, you know, somebody would have said, hey, we'll just take all that and start building it under our name or our man, you know, Ford might take it or Chrysler or somebody else would have taken the car. But I guess there just wasn't enough there for anybody to take, right? Well, here's the challenge. Um, it would have cost them an enormous amount of money to make the changes in their product line to incorporate the things in place that Tucker had. Right. And that type of investment was deemed unnecessary at the time since Tucker was off the table, so to speak. Sure. But they did go forward with adopting several of the things that were in place that he utilized. Now keep in mind too, that since Tucker was produced for such a short period of time, they really didn't have an opportunity to sort these things out fully. If right. he had the opportunity to do so, then it certainly would have advanced much better. Another thing that you've got to keep in mind with this, too, is that this wasn't a little operation. He had 250 full-time engineers, more than Packard at the time. Wow. So, so there was a big effort that went on to making these cars and making them right. Sure. Well, and we all know the story of concept cars, but by the time the accountants get a hold of it, they're, they're not going to allow them to do this and do that. And all the cool stuff you see in a concept car goes right out the window because the accountant says, you know, we can't make the transmission shifter on the roof and we can't do this, that, or the other. And so, but you know, the allure of the Tucker continues. I mean, forget the movie. I mean, it, it, I think it was, it was already well cemented before the movie and has continued even now. And the movie is ancient history in a lot of respects. Very true. Uh, you know, the interesting thing about it was is that the movie was this wonderful springboard to bring forward the awareness of the car because so many people had never heard of it. Sure. But the mainstream movie, which was not a box office success, became right. more much more popular years later. And now, whenever you have an opportunity to see a Tucker at a car show or something, it really commands a lot of attention. In fact, uh, the Tucker automobile has become the most valuable post-war sedan in the world. Yeah, absolutely. No question about it. You know, and of course, I imagine that it's very popular at the museum, Jeb. I mean, one of the most popular exhibits you have there? Oh, it's one of the focus. People travel from all over the country and the yeah. world to see it. And that's why we're hosting this big event in June on the 16th and 17th. Yeah. We'll, have, we'll have more Tuckers present than since I think the largest gathering was during the filming of the movie itself. And sure. We're, we're going to come close to matching that. And if people want more information, they can go to your website, which is what? Tell us the website so that our listeners can get to that. AACAMuseum.org. Yeah, how easy is that? When we return, I'm sure we'll delve more into, I've got more questions. I, like I said, I've done my research and homework, guys. So uh, I've got some questions maybe I can trip you up on. Doubt it, but uh, I'll try. Anyway, when we return with the Classic Auto Mall podcast here in just a minute. Talk to you soon. And we're back with the Classic Auto Mall podcast from the Classic Auto Mall studios, where we've got Jeff Bleemeister from the AACA Museum here in the studio with us, and Mark Lieberman in, uh, in a Tucker factory in Michigan. It's an undisclosed uh, location. We can't give out the address. We don't want people storming the uh, gates of the new Tucker. It looks like you're sitting in the factory. I love that. That's the idea. I'm coming yeah. to you from the factory. <laughs> I love that. Who's the guy on your over your right shoulder there? Do you know any of these guys? Are any of these guys met or still around? Uh, no, unfortunately, uh, I, I think that they all died of lead poisoning. Uh, the guys here working on the body. Yeah, the uh, the OSHA rules weren't quite the same back in uh, the late forties. Little, little, just a little bit different. You talked about the Tucker movie, and uh, you know the interesting thing: uh, Jeff Bridges starred in it. Um, and I guess at one point in time, Marlon Brando was going to be the lead for the movie, which is really interesting. I read that, I that. Uh, uh, somewhere today. And of course, you know, it was uh, Francis Ford Coppola 
Coppola uh, directed it, and uh, George Lucas convinced him to do it and became the executive director because I think – I think Coppola was out of money at this point in time in the 70s when he was thinking about doing this movie, or I guess 88's when it came out. Is that right? Was that when I read? That is the time frame. Yeah. And uh, how? What's your take on the movie? Well, you know, it, it, it's it, it's it's a I would say it's Hollywood's version of the Tucker story. And if you ask, and if you ask the Tucker family, uh, John Tucker, who is uh, Preston Tucker's grandson. Uh, uh, he, he says that it's the story according to Vera, which was Preston's wife. Right. So, so, so there are definitely some, some liberties that were taken. In fact, one of the things that we're doing at this 75th anniversary of, uh, of the Tucker 48 at the AACA Museum is that we're doing a screening of the movie. And before we're talking about to the audience, uh, the things to watch for that, uh, are, difference between the movie and reality and then afterwards right. we're going to do a question and answer session so people can really get connected between what it took to make the movie uh some of the differences between the movie and reality and then uh how that movie was actually made during that period of time with all with 22 tucker automobiles sure did vera live long enough to see the movie and, and beyond or no um uh let me recall, you know, quite honestly, I don't remember when she passed and, right. and I think it was around that time frame because she did have have discussions about the movie, but I don't remember uh, specifically the year that she passed. Sure. Well, and apparently, I guess Coppola had thought about this movie for his entire life as a kid. He had thought about it. his father, I guess, was one of the original investors in Tucker and, and actually yep. bought one of the cars off the production line. Well, you know, he, he had an, a, uh, a stock that he had purchased and he had intended on buying a car, but I don't believe that he ever was able to take delivery of that car. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. It wasn't, I mean, I can't I imagine, was there a, was there a, a pin up demand for this thing? I mean, would, do they have a hard time selling or do they sell right away? No, they had a huge demand for this thing. In fact, this is one of the problems that uh, Tucker ran into. Um, and you can do a comparison between this and and Tesla, for example, because right. as Preston was initially promoting his cars, he was taking orders for cars that were to be built, of course. Well, the government didn't like that. So they decided they were going to prohibit Tucker from taking orders for cars that were not built yet. But he still needed to generate capital to continue to fund the company. So they got rather creative and they developed an accessory program. So you could purchase luggage, um, uh, ashtray, uh, heater, um, seat covers, and radio. And by purchasing this accessory package, it would put you in line to get an automobile. And and so he generated money by selling by selling the accessories and getting people positioned to receive a car. Sure. Well, it sounds like Carol Shelby all over. I mean, Shelby was selling cars before he even. Be even earlier than this, probably at some point in time. So it, I guess, opened the way for him. You know, it sounded like the, the the deck was just stacked against Tucker from day one. The money, the the press, the the government, everybody. It seems like everybody was against this guy. It was it, it was a def, a very difficult road for him to travel, and and made it what made it even twice as difficult is Preston was the consummate showman. He always wanted to be out there touting all the things that were in his vision that were going to happen. And this kind of created some difficulties for him in that he tend to over promise because he uh, his vision was so strong and his desire to make this happen was so strong. He didn't necessarily contemplate all the obstacles that were going to prevent him from hitting these timelines. And so when he would say, we're going to be producing a thousand cars a day by this particular date, and it didn't happen, people would say, ah, well, you know, what's really going on here? Sure. What uh, crystal ball looking, if, if they'd have been funded properly and they hadn't had all these problems, would Tucker be here today? Oh, without a doubt. Um, and, and interestingly enough, I think that we would see some, uh, innovation that would have occurred earlier in the life cycle of the development of the automobile industry than where it was because Preston and his team were not so much constrained about just keeping the status quo. They really wanted to shake things up and change things. And the automotive industry at the time, while they did want to innovate and they spent a lot of money doing so, they were much more 
at a paced rate. Uh, that they wanted, they, they were actually developing things that they were planning on announcing and incorporating the cars five, six, seven, 10 years from now, where Tucker wanted it to be five, six, seven months from now. In fact, they were actually making changes and improvements on the line um, as these cars, these 50 automobiles were built. They made it, they made changes in the engine configuration. They made changes in suspension. They may, they even make change the wheelbase at car number 26. So yeah. things were occurring and changing in real time as they were building these cars. And, and is, is the first one better than the last one or the last one better than the first one? Or what's the, the argument with that or the, the consensus on that? They're different. <laughs> so, wow okay i like that I, I wouldn't say better or worse because you know they really didn't have an opportunity to fully sort these things out so while you know the early suspension being different than the late suspension um each one had certain drawbacks and certain positives but the whole thing of it was was that you had a completely unique an innovative driving experience and the the experience of operating this automobile and taking it someplace was different than any other car in 1948. Sure. And at the at the museum coming up with this uh, event in June, uh, you're going to have one of the first ones, I guess the first one, right, Jeff? Ten and, was prototype. Yeah. Museum, and correct. then the, almost the last one, 1050, right? right. So. Mark knows all the numbers, all the lists. We're going to have a great <laughs> array of cars and it's an opportunity to see something you'll never see anywhere else. Absolutely, absolutely. And is there, and the movie will screen off premise at a movie theater, We're right? We're having it at the historic Allen Theater. Oh, in, how cool is Allen, that? Yeah, right in uh, Annville, right next door. And do, uh, you know, do people in uh, Hershey appreciate and understand what Tucker is? Do they know from a standpoint, or is this mostly enthusiasts that are from all over the world? I think it's from all over. Yeah, yeah. I, I really do too. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's funny, people don't always realize what's right in their backyard, you know? We're trying to change that every we, day. Yeah, same with us. I mean, I get a guy who lives over the mountain who says, y'all have cars down there? <laughs> it's a like couple. a few. We have a, a few here and there. What? Uh, so tell us the dates of, of the event as well, too. Well, uh, I have a whole schedule here I'm going to share yeah. with you. I'm going to okay. give you your own personal invitation. Oh, cool. It's, I like uh, this. It's uh, June 16th and 17th. Yep. It starts off with a movie screening, and we, ha and we have a, a whole bunch of neat things going on. We com it uh, also coincides with our, our – Father's Day car show on the seventh on the seventeenth, right? Which is at the museum with the Tucker cars being inside for the most part. It's, it's going to be just a fantastic weekend sure. to be a part of the museum. And I imagine the the anticipation of this uh, in Tucker aficionados and just car aficionados in general are really excited about that. You got to be getting calls every day, right? We are, we are, and we're excited. Hopefully, we'll still get a few more cars. I know Mark is diligently working on lining up things right to the very end. So. Is there cars that are, I guess there's cars, are all of the cars publicly available to be seen in the world or are there a lot of them hidden away? A lot of them are hidden away in private. <laughs> Many of them haven't been seen in a long time. Um, but uh, on the other hand, there are still quite a few of them that are in uh, public museums that can be seen and enjoyed. Um, there is um, uh, quite a few of them that, are, that haven't been serviced and, and are not operational. Uh, currently, but we're seeing that change as as I get quite a few of them through our facility to be uh, to be restored. Uh, we're working on four cars right now. Um, wow. Yeah, yeah, and and we're we're waking these cars up and 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 making them ready for 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 use and touring and for people to see and hear and and enjoy. We we are the only people in the world that manufacture parts for these cars and uh, uh, go ahead and 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 put a variety of things. Uh, uh, to back in operation on these vehicles where they've sat stagnant for many years. Sure. And is a lot of that 3D printing stuff or is it just, is it casting or how is that done? How are you making these parts? Well, everything in between. So for example, we cast new cylinder heads and cylinder banks. Um, we uh, manufacture the suspensions here. And like I said, that's rubber torso elastic. Uh, and um, and then so the idea here is that we've we've involved a very important team to make this work really well, including the Tucker family, uh, the sure. Tucker great grandchildren, um, uh, Mike and Sean Tucker um, and, and Rob Ida. Um, we have kind of created the the Tucker dream team here to, sure. <laughs> to be able to 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 use technology, uh, high levels of skill and and lots of knowledge to be able to put these cars back together and keep them operational. In fact, with access to the archives, we have full access to all of the blueprints 
where these vehicles are uh, were originally designed with. And in that vein, uh, we're able to be absolutely certain about the parts that we're manufacturing to go back on these cars. And the archives are where? They are at the museum. Wow. So they've got you've got that just right there at your fingertips. Correct. So Torso Elastic. I keep nodding like I know what the hell you're talking about. What, <laughs> what is that name? I've never heard of that. So the Torso Elastic suspension is uh, a rubber tube. So you have two steel tubes that are encompassed by rubber that use uh, that basically work as a rubber torsion bar instead right. of a steel spring. And that's how the car is suspended. Wow. Isn't that crazy? And of course, I guess nobody's using that today, right? That's not it. No, it is used today, but it's used really? practically on trailers instead of automobiles. <laughs> Although there is an automobile that does use torso elastic suspension that you will be familiar with, the Messerschmitt. Really? <laughs> yes. Uh, my listeners, if they're not, uh, Messerschmitt is a really cool old car. It's uh, uh, German built, right? And uh, yeah. uh, made by, I guess, the company that manufactured the Messerschmitt airplanes back in the day, correct? There you go. With Mr. Schmidt was has been long gone, like a lot of these, and it's such a shame that some of the companies that are long gone, Packard and Mr. Schmidt and Tucker and all that. Has there ever been an attempt to make a new Tucker? Is that ever? There been? is. And I mentioned Rob Ida uh, a moment ago, and he has produced um, a uh, recreation Tucker. Uh, I think he's done four of them now, uh, and uh, uh, he powers them by. Um, twin turbocharged North Star engine. <laughs> oh, nice. And it makes, right, it makes for quite a machine. Uh, <laughs> but, but yes, there have been some attempts at reproductions over the years. There are some continuations out there where people have used some Tucker parts and built cars that were uh, not produced at the factory. Sure. Uh, but for the most part, there's just this enormous enthusiasm about preserving the Tucker history and appreciating what these cars are and what they meant to uh, uh, the automotive industry as a whole. Fantastic. When we return, we will continue our conversation with uh, Mark uh, on his Zoom in his factory in uh, Michigan and uh, Jeff Leemeister here in the studio with us on the Classic Auto Mall podcast. Be back in just a minute. And we're back with the Classic Auto Mall podcast. Don't forget to go to our website, classicautomall.com, and uh, check out all of our inventory and things coming up. And We've got uh, a lot going on right now, but man, it sounds like Jeff at the museum, you guys with this Tucker thing. I mean, this is, is this your most ambitious weekend event you've ever done? Oh, most definitely. Yeah. yeah we've been planning this, this small group led by Mark and a team at the museum have been planning this for several years now. We Last time they did anything big, I believe it was at Pebble Beach and that was several years ago. I think it was for the 70s. So we wanted to capitalize and be the center of the Tucker universe for the 75th. Sure. Because of Mark's efforts and the team, we're getting, going to be there. I mean, cars and artifacts and documents and just all, it's amazing the collection of stuff that you have there and that's been entrusted to Oh, you. it's really incredible. Like I said, we, as Mark mentioned, we have all the factory blueprints. We have samples of pretty much everything. We have corporate re records. It goes on and on. And it's sure. available to, to serious people who want to do research. Yeah, so if, if, if somebody wants to research something about a Tucker or, or other cars for that exam for that uh, matter, uh, you all have the ability to do that for people, right? Well, for Tucker, we certainly do. Yeah, yes. yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it's amazing that, you know, I would imagine that there's still historians that are still writing books and, and, and discussing Tuckers to oh, this yeah. day. We get, we get calls for information and photographs, especially... Interestingly, from from artists and authors from other parts of the world, Europe in particular. Sure, I mean, sure. Mark can tell you more, but they come from all over the place. Sure. There's a worldwide interest in this car. Well, and and I think that it will, you know, as long as you continue these efforts, I think it will continue, continue, continue. Steve, I think I lost my headphones. There I went. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so I guess Coppola and uh, Lucas both owned two Tuckers each. When they were making this movie or before the movie, and then then and uh, Lucas sold one of them, is that correct? Yep, you have that right. Oh, see, I'm I'm quite the researchist. Uh, nice job. <laughs> anytime, you know, it's uh, that's what I live for is trying to figure out how things that I can talk about. I always over prepare and under deliver, as they like to say. But uh, <laughs> so, I mean, the value of Tucker's today is phenomenal. I was doing some research on pricing and looking at what some have sold for, and you know, of course, there's been various auction houses that have sold them uh, over the years. But there's one in particular that I'm kind of curious about, and I hope it's not a sort subject but there's a convertible out there for 3.5 million dollars what's the story uh, on that uh it, it, you know and i i guess i i should be cautious as to as to how how i respond to this but uh um officially the the tucker club 
uh, does not recognize that as a factory right. car. Um, I, in fact, I personally was there when the fellow started building this car. Right. And um, um, I, can, I can say that we consider that car a continuation and that it had, uh, uh, it had not been uh, a part of any of the uh, uh, Tucker manufactured cars. Sure. So the last one that sold at auction was not that long ago, right? Didn't one sell at uh, RM or something here recently or within the past year or two? Yes, yes. The, uh, RM has sold several. Um, there, uh, you know, I continue to, uh, to to sell the cars as well. But uh, I think the uh, record uh, was actually done at Barrett Jackson uh, in 2012. Uh, that car sold for 2.915, and that was one of the cars that I owned. I didn't own oh. it at the time. But that was <laughs> darn <a> luck. <laughs> right, right. That was one of the six cars that I've owned. I've owned. Yeah, uh, you know, it, uh, Barrett is always amazing to all of us in the hobby. They they just they get these home run prices. Whether it was the Future Liner bus uh, that they sold or the Tucker, they always seem to to build the hype and the buzz on these cars and, or, or special one offs or, or specialty type cars that were limited production or limited availability. And they do an amazing job of that. I mean, to get two point nine million dollars for one, uh, and I love that I. I saw back in the day that Cruz had sold one in 98 for $315,000, <laughs> you know, and it was, it was a running and driving example. It wasn't a, you know, a parts car, you know, it was, uh, but you know, 98 was uh, a different world. It, it, it was. And if you, you know, you go back and, uh, and certainly in the seventies and eighties, these cars were, uh, were interesting old cars that had no mechanical support systems uh, in order to, uh, to acquire parts or technology from. So the Tucker Club assembled in 1972, I think it was, and started to create their own network of being able to support these cars. And as a result, um, it built enthusiasm. In fact, at one point in time, I think the Tucker Club membership uh, was as high as eight or 900 people. Wow. You know, you think about that, you've got you, you've got 47 automobiles <laughs> and, and, and 800 members to the club. Yeah, exactly. Now, are all I guess all the owners are members. Is that an honorary lifetime membership if you own a Tucker? Um, it, and oddly enough, not all of them are members. Um, you know, there are a number that are uh, of of museums that own them instead of individuals, sure. and certainly a museum sure. to be a member. Uh, but uh, um, the the uh, Tucker community, Tucker owner community, um, is uh, is an interesting group, and some of them are very enthusiastic about the cars. And others are very private about the cars. Sure. So, so, yeah, so you, you have you have a vi you you have a wide difference uh, of uh, of approach to celebrating these vehicles. Sure. And do you see any in the future that'll be on the market anytime soon that we know about, or is anything coming up at auction or or a private sale that uh, we know about that might be one available if somebody were so inclined to buy one? Well, generally speaking, I always have have one in my back pocket, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, um, uh, there's nothing that's currently slated for auction. Right. So what what was the trigger that triggered you into becoming the Tucker guy? How did that what what happened? Well, somebody had to be right. Exactly. Uh, uh, so um, in in the in the early 90s, uh, 91 or late 91, early 92, um, I got a phone call from a good friend of mine. Um, who parked his car for the winter storage. You know, here in Michigan, it gets cold and terrible and people tend to store <laughs> their cars away. Sure. And uh, uh, he used to park his his Mustang in uh, uh, an old parking structure behind the State Theater in downtown Detroit. Um, and I got a phone call from him one day and he said, Mark, um, would you be interested in a Tucker, knowing that I'm a car guy? And, and I said, well, I'm always interested in a Tucker. What have you heard? He says, well, there's a car down here in the old parking structure that's owned by the guy that owns the parking structure. And uh, I think he'd be willing to sell it. And I said, no, there's not a Tucker down there. What are you talking about? He said, no, I'm, I'm not kidding. There's one down here. So I hopped in my car and went down and looked at it. <laughs> Lo and behold, back in this dusty, dark, dirty corner, here's a car parked in the corner that had sat since 1958 and was full right up to the door sills with garbage. Wow. I mean, they, you, they practically used it as a dumpster. Wow. Um, and and I'm talking to the uh, owner of the facility, and he says, says, yeah, I'm planning on restoring this one day. And <laughs> I knew that there was no way that that was going to happen. 
Um, so I sat down and negotiated a deal with him, penned him a check, and wouldn't leave until my flatbed got there. Yeah, I don't blame you. <laughs> and we, load, we loaded the car up, and I brought it home, and that was um, what would be a life-changing experience because sure. it, it led me to uh, uh, to to restoring that car to be the, the you know the first car that was actually researched and restored properly to a Concours level. Um, that was car number six, and then. After car number six, I just started going one after another after another. And I continue to this day uh, in uh, buying, uh, restoring, and selling uh, special uh, Tucker automobiles uh, and the uh, the parts to keep these things alive. Sure. And how do people find you if they're looking for something Tucker? Is there, do you have a website? That yeah, absolutely. Go? NostalgicMotoringLimited.com. Uh, we buy, sell, and restore all types of interesting collecting automobiles. Uh, and uh, you'll find uh, uh, certainly links to all the special Tucker stuff there as well. Sure, sure. I guess there's a lot of information out there on Tucker's and out on the web and, and all of that. If you just Google it, I'm sure you can find lots of things. But it's like anything on the Internet, you know, what's what's accurate and what's not. And and that's where the AACA Museum comes in, because you can refute or dispute or tell people that that is true or not true on something. Right. right. Yeah. We field questions almost daily about the Tucker. Collection. Sure. And I imagine a lot of it is myth and legend and the movie based and, and all that stuff as well, too. But I would imagine that also, you know, I guess people, if somebody's thinking of buying a Tucker, they obviously want to do their due diligence and, and call you guys and call you, uh, Mark, and, and learn a little bit more before they dive in and buy something that maybe wasn't the right car. Indeed. Well, we're, we're here to help, and uh, uh, we, we have spent an enormous amount of time trying to understand these cars better, uh, and make sure that uh, they're preserved for the generations ahead to appreciate like we do. We do. Sure, sure. And you mentioned Rob Ida. He's an integral player in all of this, right? I mean, he's been involved with Tuckers for quite a while as well. Well, his grandfather had a dealership. <laughs> oh, wow. And that's no, how that's... it started. started. Wow. What, so that would have been, were the dealerships opened in 47 or were they, did they open when the first cars came out of the factory? Or they opened a lot? They started selling, they started selling dealerships in 47. And so right. uh, people bought franchises in the, in the anticipation of having cars to sell. And uh, initially uh, uh, Preston would send out certain cars to dealerships so they could display them and demonstrate them. And then early on, uh, well, I should say, as that moved along a bit, uh, he was selling the de the cars to the dealerships. And so a few cars got sold through the dealerships. Most of the cars got sold at the liquidation auction when right. uh, following the closure of the company. Right. How many dealers were there when they first started? Uh, there was over 2,000. <laughs> and, and we have some of those contracts. I've read some of them. It's it's wow. really interesting snapshot in history to, to review wow. one of those. They, he, they was were a, serious. They yeah. were serious about this. And he was a hell of a salesman too, right? I mean, Preston Tucker, yes. to, to get 2,000 dealerships, that's got to be mighty impressive. So uh, did anybody, so who, did did any particular dealer sell like two or three or was it, who was the winner in that? <laughs> I, I don't know that there was a, a, a winner in that. In fact, if you speak to any of the descendants of the dealer old, holders, I think that they would say that there were more losers than winners on that one. I would imagine it'd be interesting to know what was the do you remember what the franchise cost was back in back then Jeff does there was there a number that there was in a there was some suggested number I can't remember do you remember what it was Mark what, what you needed in capital to incorporate 70 I think it was seventy five hundred dollars oh wow of course that was a lot of money in 1947 yeah. we're just out of a war um, you right. know but of course I mean it was a good time to be in the car business it had some things going for it to be starting then I mean that was the, the start of an era of time that was as successful as we've ever seen in this country from you know after the war until the through the 50s. It was. It was. It was a time of growing prosperity. People had a lot of hope. Uh, people wanted to uh, experience life. They had come through the war. Uh, they had uh, still fresh memories of of difficult times. And at this point, you know, the the economy was growing. Uh, there was a big push for for infrastructure and road building and highways and travel. Keep in mind, at that point in time, motoring was an activity. Right. You know, the idea of, of having freedom from from uh, um, uh, with your automobile was was, you know, something that was really treasured. You know, now freedom to to kids today is their telephone. 
Well, right. then freedom was your automobile. And so it was such an integral part, part of your life that they marketed very specifically to people and certain groups. And the idea there was that you should find the right automobile that you connect with because this was your connection to the outside world. Sure, absolutely. Well, it sounds like, Mark, we could do this all day long and you wouldn't be for a lack of any information. <laughs> uh, we really appreciate you being on. Jeff, tell us once again how people find out about this event and uh, and when the dates are and all that good stuff. If you search uh, Tucker 75th in, in the internet, we'll come up, but go to our directly to our museum website aacamuseum.org join us on the 16th and 17th of june for a once in a lifetime celebration of everything tucker yeah i highly re recommend everybody uh participate in this and go see it because it's an amazing story and uh and we've learned a little bit about that today and thanks so much to both of you guys for being here uh, in person and online and go back to your factory job because i see you guys putting the bolt on the wrong place i've got work to do back here with the factory, <laughs> but make, make sure that you get out and get online and buy your tickets for this yes. event because seating is limited absolutely yes, it's well worth it Absolutely. And don't want to miss it on, on the sellout. So anyway, thanks so much for listening today, folks, and uh, catch us again next week when we'll have another interesting guest or guests on the uh, Classic Auto Mall podcast. If you have any questions, podcast at classicautomall.com. And you can also visit our website, classicautomall.com, and we'll see you next week. Thanks a lot.